Hey everyone, uh, thanks so much for coming to my session this afternoon. Um, my name is Emily Austin. I am a security researcher at Census, um, where I study weird, unusual, or otherwise interesting things on the internet. Um, and today I want to talk to you specifically about what I'm going to call defensive counting, um, or how to quantify industrial control system exposure on the internet when the data is less than friendly. Um, before I actually get into this, though, I do want to say that this, I, while I'm up here talking to you about this, this was a huge team effort by the entire census research team. And so I just want to acknowledge the efforts of Aiden, Ariana, Himaja, and Mark on this, um, because this was truly, again, a, a team project. So here's what I'm going to talk to you about today, kind of a rough overview. Um, I will spend a bit of time talking about research motivations and some context for this, just because it is a rather applied problem. Um, but then we'll get into some kind of talking about some existing work before we talk about the actual quantification piece. Uh, and we'll wrap up with some takeaways, talk about kind of where do we go from here and get a little philosophical. Um, so let's just get right into it. So I imagine like maybe a lot of you in this room, um, my career has been in varying degrees at the intersection of security and analytics or data science. And a couple of years ago, I was having a conversation with someone uh, with a similar background, although more, much more on the data science side. And they said to me, you know, security people, you don't really like to count things, um, but why don't you move beyond counting? Where's all the like really interesting analysis? Where's the cool modeling and, and all the cool fancy stuff? And I, I sort of took umbrage with this statement for, for a couple of reasons. Um, the first is that, you know, I think this track at this conference is ample evidence that work like that exists very much in the wild. So you just have to know where to look for it. Um, but the second piece that I, that I really didn't love about this statement is that counting is actually hard. Well, let me back up. So maybe counting is easy, but counting the correct things is actually challenging, particularly when you want to do this at internet scale. So for a slightly less philosophical motivation for this presentation. Um, there is a lot going on in this slide, but um, this represents sort of a, a high level overview of a string of threat activity against critical infrastructure, particularly in the US, um, with some focus on water and wastewater. Um, I'll call your attention to the screenshot here in the upper right. Um, this is an HMI or a human machine interface, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, that was uh, defaced last fall by an Iranian actor. This, they went after these Israeli manufactured devices um, after some local tensions in the region and uh, actually defaced these panels. This one, um, you might have heard the story about a water facility in Aliquippa, Pennsylvania uh, that was hit with this. Um, there are also increasing concerns around People's Republic of China based actors gaining and maintaining access to critical infrastructure networks. Um, and the, the final big piece I'll talk about here um, is the screenshot on the bottom right, um, the Cyber Army of Russia Reborn, um, which is an actor that's maybe potentially affiliated with the Russian military. Um, in early uh, 2024, gained access to several water system control panels for small cities in Texas. Um, this is actually a screenshot from one of the videos that they posted on Telegram showing their access and sort of messing around with the control panel. So I want to go over just a little bit of terminology because there is a lot of jargon in the ICS space. Um, ICS, when I talk about that, I'm talking about industrial control systems. Um, and these are really any systems that are used in manufacturing and automation processes. Um, a lot of them also fall into the category of critical infrastructure. But these are not mutually inclusive, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, another thing to be aware of here are automation protocols. So these are used for communication between industrial devices. Um, so things like building automation or power system automation, meter reading, et cetera. Um, they're really kind of low level protocols. Many of them have been around for a lot of years. Uh, and they also typically don't have any form of authentication on them. Some other concepts to be aware of as we talk about this um, are human machine interfaces or HMIs. Um, so these are the, as you might, Imagine by the name, these are the interfaces that operators use to monitor and interact with these systems. Um, while they are on site at these facilities many times, they also offer remote access. 
And the final thing I'll mention here is web admin interfaces, which also might be self-explanatory, um, but they go a step further and provide HTTP-based management interfaces. So this is literally something you can look at in your browser if you know the IP and the port. Um, they, a lot of times, ship with default credentials. So what I'll, I'll leave you with in regards to these kinds of systems is um, they're not necessarily paragons of security engineering. So critical infrastructure. Um, I have a couple screenshots here from CISA in the US and the NPSA in the UK. But when we talk about critical infrastructure, just to get a clear definition, we're talking about infrastructure that is considered so essential or critical uh, by governments or nations for the functioning of their society and their economy. Um, different nations will have like slightly varying definitions of what is actually critical infrastructure. But the important thing to know here is, right, these are things that commonly include you know, power or energy, uh, emergency services, water, healthcare. Um, and for this research, kind of given those previous attacks that we talked about, we focused on water and wastewater specifically. So our goal for this research was really to develop a quality data set, a high fidelity data set of industrial control systems devices that would be granular and accurate enough for us to be able to notify the owners of these devices that they had a problem. This is our goal. This is our undertaking. Now, I do want to acknowledge we are far from the first folks to try to quantify industrial control systems devices on the internet. Um, this is just a sampling of, of many, many, many pieces of research from both academia and industry. Um, a lot of these works focus on several different automation protocols specifically, um, and maybe a subset of the ones that we examined. Um, in some cases, it's not clear whether the researchers excluded known honeypots or deceptive services from these counts. Um, and in some cases, it's also not really clear what the implications of the exposure numbers are. So for instance, if I tell you there are you know, 7,000 Modbus services exposed on the internet, but I kind of leave it at that, I'm not really painting a picture of the actual threat landscape, right? Like there needs to be a little more context there. What might those be connected to? What could someone do with those things? Um, and so we wanted to keep building on this body of research. We felt like there was still something we could dig into and, and really figure out about this. And uh, so we took all of this knowledge, decided we wanted to build on it, and we, we got to work. So let's talk briefly about the base data set. Um, so at Census, we scan the entire IPv4 space, some of IPv6, uh, all the time, 65K port scanning. Um, we have about 250 million IPv4 hosts in our data set right now, um, with about 5 billion services. Within that, um, we have coverage of 22 different ICS, or automation protocols, and over 200 different types of ICS software. So this is sort of our base data set, what we're, what we're dealing with. All right, so let's get into the quantification. That's perfect, like halfway through. All right, so first, as sort of a step zero, um, we kind of, we knew we wanted to shore up the data um, before we really dug in. So this is kind of our data enrichment phase. Um, there were two pieces to this. So we knew from the outset that we wanted to improve our collection and detection of various ICS protocols and software. Um, so some of this was discovering different software on HTTP, like in browser interfaces. Some of it was discovering interesting things over VNC. Um, and as our researchers on this team started finding the software, they also started noticing other interesting protocols running on these same hosts. These were protocols that we maybe didn't have a detailed scanning logic for. And so some folks on our team actually wrote some. Um, so this is the second piece you see here, this collecting additional data. Um, and I'll call your attention to PCOM here. Um, PCOM is actually a proprietary Unitronics protocol. Um, you might remember that screenshot with the red hacked message earlier. Um, that's also a Unitronics device. So we felt like it was particularly relevant to, to scan for, for PCOM and add that to our data set. So this gives us about 57,000 industrial control systems exposed to the internet in the US. Now, because we work in this internet measurement, internet analytics space, because we're data people, we knew that there would be false positives in this data. 
Um, and in, in this context, we're, when we say false positives, we're talking about honeypots. So uh, in this case, right, like these are things that are pretending to be something they're not, they're, the, they're duplicitous. Um, and there are a couple of really common, well-known ICS honeypots out there. Um, a couple I'll talk about today are gas pot and con pot. Um, both of them are actually available on GitHub, so you can audit the code, you can look at them, you can run them yourselves. Um, you go home today and, and spin one up. Um, but in detecting these, you know, analyzing the code, some folks on our team were able to figure out, uh, so in the screenshot on the far left, you can see a gas pot uh, instance in our data. This is a screenshot from census search. Um, and there's some interesting differences in the date format in real uh, ATG, or automated tank gauge uh, systems, versus the honeypot. Um, automated tank gauge is a, is a computerized system that collects and displays information about underground tanks. So like your local gas station, fuel station will sometimes run these. Um, but that's one way we can detect those. Um, another that we knew we wanted to like pull out of the data is called CONPOT. Um, and CONPOT allows you to emulate a variety of different services, including like uh, Modbus and S7. But um, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle enthusiasts might notice um, in the, these screenshots on the, in the middle and on the right, um, for instance, on the right, you can see the system is Technodrome, and you can see that the plant ID is Mouser Factory. So just some fun little tells for those there. So we subtracted these and other similar services out of our, our data set. So this leaves us with about 42,000 honeypots or, or 42,000 services rather with those removed. Um, and so now that we have this reasonably comprehensive set of data, we realized we wanted to filter it even further because we, we wanted to, again, focus on those things that were particularly important for water and wastewater. Um, and so we wanted to filter out protocols that are most commonly associated with building control. So like running the lights in an office building, um, the you know, security system or door system. Not that that isn't important and not that someone could not cause harm with those, but again, they felt a little bit on the edge of relevance for us given our very specific focus on water and wastewater. Um, so Fox and BACnet are those two protocols that we opted to remove from this data to sort of filter out. This leaves us with about 18,000 ICS protocols in the US. And so we've gone from like 57,000 to 18,000 and now we start to ask, you know, what metadata can we glean by, you know, looking at maybe the network where these devices run? Um, maybe there's useful DNS or who is information. Maybe there's other interesting tells that will help us figure out, you know, maybe who owns them. So spoiler, no, that's not at all what happened. Um, so this is the top 10 networks or autonomous systems where we see ICS protocols in the U.S. And there is a long tail on this. It is truncated to 10. You might notice a lot of consumer um, or business ISPs here, um, things like Comcast, AT&T. You might also notice T-Mobile, so a mobile network. Um, I'm actually curious, uh, is anybody here familiar with Selco part? Gabe, you cannot answer. Anybody familiar with Selco part? OK, Selco part is actually Verizon. Um, so. Uh, when we start to look at some of the metadata of these hosts running on these networks, there's not really a lot that's very useful there. You know, when we look at DNS, when we look at the who is, it all points back to the telco. Um, and these are often running these, you know, low-level automation protocols that don't really give you a lot of information about who owns them or where they might be or any other details. Um, so again, considering that original goal that we, you know, had of wanting to um, identify owners for as many of these, we went back to the user interfaces. So these user interfaces, or HMIs, um, we identified around 430 internet accessible HMIs. Um, you can see the variety of industries here. Oil and gas is a whole other story that we'll talk about another time. Um, but for water, we found just under 100. And there's some really helpful details about uh, things in, the, in these HMIs in that they'll often like, just present you with stuff like this. It's like City of X plant or City of X water treatment station. Um, and you're able to you know, go and look at the geolocation of the host, use a little Googling, and you can actually figure out like, oh yeah, this is probably this water facility. Here's a contact. I'm going to email them, right? Um, and in some cases, we actually even find the you know, picture of the tank itself, which we can then uh, find on Google Maps and verify that that's actually what it is. 
Um, so the HMIs were actually pretty useful in identifying, identifying ownership. So ultimately, of these roughly 100 water-related HMIs, we were able to confidently identify owners for about half of them. And so I just want to let that sink in for a minute. We started with around 57,000 devices in the US. And we identified owners for 50 of them. I'll leave that there. All right, so let's talk conclusions in this last few minutes. So first, I think one thing we learned from this is that you know, looking at the protocol exposure, those you know, things like Modbus and BACnet and those things, um, that's one part of the puzzle to understanding this story. I think it's also really important to consider those internet accessible control panels because those are things where you don't have to have a lot of specialized knowledge. You can access it in your browser and go start clicking around if there's no authentication, which many of them don't have authentication. It's also not necessarily the number of devices themselves. I sort of was trying to tease this on that last slide. Um, it's not the number of devices that's so concerning, um, but I think what's really, really concerning and the point to drive home here is the real ones we do find, in particular the ones that we, we identify owners for, they're often they're cities, they're actual like municipalities, water plants, or drinking water facilities. Um, and those are particularly worrisome when they're not protected by any kind of authentication, a VPN, any sort of measures yeah. like that. And finally, I will leave you with this. I will zoom out and be a little philosophical for a moment. Um, and I'll just say, you know, Simple tasks sometimes can be deceptively challenging, um, and counting is actually hard to do correctly. That's all I have. Thank you so much. We can, yeah. Yeah, and if anyone has questions, I'd be happy to, I think we have a little time, be happy to, to, to take them. I'm also very happy to chat afterwards. You can find me, uh, happy to chat. How you doing? Uh, hey, you? Any attempts to contact Verizon or any of these providers and try to, you know, work out attribution? Yes, that's an excellent question. So I think we probably need more than just our resources to get all of these telcos in a room and say, hey, help us figure out who owns these. Have you tried the ISACs? No, not specifically, but that is a good lead. Thank you. Hello, thank you for your presentation. Uh, question, uh, you mentioned the Modbus protocol and similar protocols that are unsafe. Um, currently there is no incentive or benefit for the uh, companies that are using these protocols to migrate to a safer one and therefore uh, no incentive for the vendors to stop implementing those in their products mm -hmm. because therefore uh, if they do customers won't acquire the product. So how do you see that moving forward? And do you expect a mandate to come out on that? Thank yeah, you. So this, yeah, thank you. This is a really good question. So I think this kind of gets to the point that there are issues sort of at all the levels with this, right? Like there's issues in the manufacturer space because there isn't really pressure to improve security for these devices, at least in the US right now from kind of a regulatory perspective. Um, I don't know what the future of that looks like. I don't know that things will change vastly without some type of enforcement or regulation. Um, so yeah, I think, I think there's potentially a path forward there. I know, um, I believe in the UK, they've enacted some uh, manufacturing, kind of the, putting the burden on the manufacturer. And so I'm very curious to see how that goes over the next few years. And then maybe, maybe that's something we adopt here. I think we can do this at the last part. Okay. Yeah, and I'm happy, like I said, please find me after. I'd love to chat more about this. Um, so with water, I know that they're pretty like uh, cash trapped. It's really a thin business. Yep. So do you think that there's like something that should be done? Because they just don't have the money to do any of this stuff. Like it's not kind of not their fault in a way. There's no money. Yep. 
and no and they're all thin operations so like what do you think the solution is to actually bring these uh utilities up to speed to what you know the threat landscape actually is yeah so that's an excellent question so one of the things i know uh, i think the epa is now responsible for drinking water facilities in the u.s and i know with some of the recent kind of attacks and things like that they've um, stepped up their inspections and enforcement actions and they're, I think, also offering resources. If you reach out, if you're a water facility and you reach out to the EPA, they will help you uh, make some of these assessments. So I think, you know, trying to find ways to offer those resources because, yeah, a lot of these, especially these small kind of municipalities, are resource strapped. Um, so I think finding ways that that the regulatory bodies can step in and offer assistance is probably going to be um, going to be key. Yeah. Right. And I think that's all the time we have. But thank you all so much. I appreciate it.